I welcome us this uh, this Bible study that we have online where we get to uh, look into the scriptures and understand what is God's perfect will for us. And we can never have enough of the word of God. And so I invite us all. My name is Antonina, uh, a pastor serving with People of the Way International, a ministry that is very focused and intentional about evangelism, discipleship, and relationship building. And this evening, as we seek to unpack the scriptures, um, I'm coming from a place where I feel excited in my spirit because of many confirmations from the word of God. I've been attending the church and politics summit that has been going on since um, the 16th, which is on Wednesday. And it was a three day summit and we were able to feed from men and women of God who have served the Lord faithfully across different generations and sitting uh, to listen to their wisdom as they have regurgitated over the word of God concerning the role of church and politics. Of course, that is such a contentious issue for so many believers across, um, you know, across the world. But we were able to, you know, uh, be taken through uh, an unpacking of the truths of the word of God and what God says in his word concerning the role that we all must play. And it was without a doubt that um, when Yeshua introduces himself as the king, king is a political language. It's a political title. He is the king of the universe. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there are many things that we were taught. And for me, it was such a joy to just hear uh, lots of clarification and lots of affirmation of what God has been speaking to us, particularly as people of the way international. Well, tonight, that is not the message that I want to bring to us. But one of my takeaways was a new term that I learned from Archbishop Anthony Muheria, who was one of the speakers, and he talked about pontifex. Pontifex. It is a new term that I learned, and I love words. I love learning new words. So he talked about a pontifex, and he encouraged Christians to arise and become pontifex. And what is Pontifex. A pontifex is a build, bridge builder, a bridge builder. And as I was thinking about the topic that we will be addressing ourselves tonight, and the topic is announce good news to the poor, announce good news to the poor. This term came in at the right time because as we seek to announce good news to the poor, and as we seek to do what Yeshua did, then we want to join him in his role as a bridge builder. Of course, in Kenya right now, when you talk about bridges, it has this very negative connotation and people do not want to identify with the idea of bridges. But when this term was unpacked and discussed, it became very clear that a bridge and the idea of bridges, it is that thought and term and concept of uh, enabling that people who have lack of access to certain things that they need for life are enabled to get to those, uh, to those uh, concepts, to those resources that they need. And we will be looking at the idea of being able to craft those resources and availing them to poor people. That is what we are going to be discussing tonight. Because Yeshua could have been born anywhere, but there's a place he chose to be born. And we will be looking at that a little later on. But as we begin on this topic, I would want to begin by debunking the notion 
that some people have that poor people are poor because they have chosen to be poor. Poor people are where they are because they are lazy. People are poor because they are unintelligent. And these are thoughts and ideas that some people entertain. In fact, it is very sad to note that some people who probably grew up from the less privileged spaces, they grew up from poor habitations. And for one reason or another, God gets them out of that situation and they are enabled and they become people who are wealthy, people who can be mentioned or people who have even access to education. They will sometimes forget the reality from where they were and begin to carry these nation, notions around that, you know, I made it because I was hardworking. I made it because I was bright in school. I was, you know, I was able to break free from the shackles of poverty because, because. And when you look at the because reasons, they have all these reasons. But as if to purport that poor people are poor because they are poor, or rather because they are unintelligent, they're not clever enough, or they are um, lazy, or simply because they have chosen to be poor. But I pray that tonight we will begin to see poverty and poor people from God's perspective. And you will realize, as I have, that poor people are actually some of the most hardworking persons you will find around the world. People who give their energy, people who expend themselves, they wake up early and they will trek for long distances to the place where they have to participate in their economic endeavors. And they sweat and they toil so hard only to carry home 300 shillings or, you know, little amounts that can barely help them to eke a living for their families. And so poverty must be seen, not just from a poor person's perspective, but from God's perspective. And from God's perspective, poverty is seen as an elaborate, well-organized and choreographed systemic evil that keeps people in the shackles of lack. I will repeat that. That poverty from God's perspective must be seen as a well-organized, well-choreographed, systemic evil that keeps people in the shackles of lack. So it is a stronghold. It is a system. In other words, there are those people who thrive, who thrive and make it in life by ensuring that poor people remain poor. But poverty must also be seen as an enemy of the kingdom of God. Because poverty robs people of their God-given dignity. A man is emasculated from being able to provide for his family in a dignified way. Women are made to grovel. Or in another term, nasty term, to bend over in order to make ends meet and to put food on the table for their children. Children are forced to grope and beg in the streets of the cities like vagabonds. People who have no place to call a home, they walk around, they wander around hopeless, helpless, in the cold of night. 
if we see things from God's perspective, then I hope that godly anger will arise from us and push us to seeking the mission of Yeshua. And what is the mission of Yeshua? And what, what is the why of the mission of Yeshua? Why did Yeshua come? And if you are like me, you may have wondered why the King of glory, why the Lord Almighty came as he did. You know, if he is like most of us, we like to enter last and enter, you know, in a grand way so that we make a statement by our entrance. But the God of the universe, knowing that these were options he would have taken, he chose to dress up like a human being of all creatures. He could have come like Superman. He could have been, you know, he could have come as an angel at least. You know, angels are, you know, they have a lot of dignity with them. But he chose to dress up, to clothe himself with humanity. He also chose to be born as a helpless little child. Why would he come as a child? In most places, children are not valued. Children are not listened to. But the maker of the universe chose to be born, to enter not as a grown-up adult, a man. No, he entered like a helpless little babe. And thirdly, he chose not to be born in a palace. Oh my goodness. Even King Solomon's palace could not stand at the majesty and awe of the one who sits on the, the throne that governs the universe. But please remember that King Solomon's temple, oh, and his throne, his palace, was a wonder of the world. It was full of splendor. All the good things that human beings could conjure up together were in Solomon's palace. But no, he did not even choose Herod's palace, which was so much lower than King Solomon's palace. But Yeshua chose to be born in a manger amongst those who were economically challenged, bound in the shackles of poverty. Because Joseph didn't have much to his name, neither did Mary. But Yeshua chose to be born in a manger. Now, these three things are very important. The idea of being born as a human being, of being born as a child and being born in a manger are important for us because they capture for us what Philippians 2 tells us, that he chose humility. When he entered the terrestrial sphere of humanity, God chose the lowliest. God chose the least of these. This is amazing. These three have intrinsic value. God given inherent value. A child is valuable before God. A human being is valuable before God. And the lowly places like a manger where people who are economically challenged dwell, those places are of value before God. And as you are listening to me, COVID-19 of 2020 hit some people so hard. I know of some people who are thriving in business, but right now they are struggling to put a meal on the table. So many businesses were shut down. So many people have lost their livelihoods. So many people have lost their dignity. And you could be listening to me and you're in that category of being lowly, of feeling helpless and poor. I 
have a message for you from the Lord. And when you think about what life is, I want to submit to us, everyone who's listening to me, that life is a test on stewardship. Life is a test on stewardship. Where do I gather that? I gather that from the book of Matthew chapter 25, where Yeshua gives a parable of this owner, of this rich, wealthy person who went to a far country, but before he left, he left his servants with three categories of talents. One was given five, another one was given two, another one was given one. And in my research, I discovered that the person who was given one talent, now notice everyone was given something, everyone was given something, but they were given talents according to their ability. The person who was given five was because they had been given the ability to handle five talents. Now, one talent was equivalent to 20 years wages, 20 years wages. So I would want you to calculate, do the math by yourself. How much is your wage per month times 12 to get how much you would be earning in a year? And then multiply that with 20 years to have an idea of the amount of money, amount of wealth that was in the hands of the person that was given one talent. So the person who was given five talents, he was given an amount worth a hundred years wages. In other words, they were given more than enough. More than enough. But then you know how the story goes. And the person with five went and multiplied and brought five more. And the one who was given two went and did uh, his work and brought two more. But the person who was given one goes and buries it. And he has this misrepresentation of the owner. So that when the owner comes back, he tells him, I knew that you were a hard man. That you go and reap. You go to harvest where you have not sown. The question is, is that true of the master? No, absolutely not. Now, this is the reality, brothers and sisters who are listening to me. Life is a test on stewardship. There is nothing you have that you have not been given. Look at yourself in the mirror. If you find yourself beautiful, that beauty has been given to you by God. If you have energy in your body, that energy has been given to you by God. If you have life breath, that breath has been entrusted to you by God. Look at the people we call heroes, the people who run very fast. But even that ability to run fast is given by God. Look at the people we place to lead us, the people who are charismatic, the people who are intelligent. That intelligent is not theirs. It's an endowment from God. Those children who lead in their studies and in their education, they have been given that by God. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that we have that we have not been given. Even the people that we idolize because of their talents and abilities to sing and dance and do those amazing things, they are that because they've been given. That skill you use in the marketplace, you have been given. My ability to teach the word of God has been given to, by God. And what we forget many times sometimes is that we will stand before God and give an account of how we have carried out our stewardship. Now, my prayer is, that if there are clothes in your wardrobe that you are not using, you will realize that you are being tested on stewardship and that which you are not using, you will give it away. That if you have food in the fridge that you are not going to use to satisfy your belly, instead of throwing away that food and filling your fridge, you will consider to be generous with the poor. If you have more blankets than you need, 
There are people who are sleeping in the streets. You will consider to share the extras of the beddings that you have with the poor people. If you have a skill of representation, you are probably in the law, in the legal fraternity. You have a skill that can be able to get people out of poverty because some of them are in poverty because they have been denied their rights. I have met widows who are in the slums because when their spouses died, they were literally thrown out of their land, of their houses. And the fatherless and the widows are in the slums. You have a skill that can be able to be used by God to get people to access their rights. Brothers and sisters, whatever you have, you have something. And that which you have been entrusted, you can use it to the glory of God to alleviate people from the bondage and the shackles of poverty. Now the topic about announcing good news to the poor. This is important because as Christians, we do not have the luxury to craft our own new mandate. No. Christians were called Christians because they were imitators of a person called Yeshua. He is the one who sets for us the agenda, the priority of our mandate and pursuits of life. Now he tells us, of course, in John chapter 14, that those who believe in him will do even greater things than what he did. In other words, what Yeshua is promising is that those who imitate him will do greater, will go farther, do amazing things than what he did. That's what he says in the book of John. That if you, that indeed I tell you, verse 12, that whosoever trusts in me will also do the works I do. Indeed, he will do greater ones because I am going to the Father. Now, note what Yeshua is saying. He is saying that those who are his, those who belong to him, will do the works he did. So the first stop for every Christian should be, what are the works that Yeshua did? Because those are the works that we should concern ourselves with. But then it does not stop there. He says, indeed, they will do even greater works than these. Why? Because I am going to the Father. What does that mean? What does it mean that he has gone to the Father and because of that, we will do greater works? Well, it is because when he went to the Father, he sat at the right hand of the power. And he did that for the sake of the messianic community, for the sake of the church of, 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 of Jesus Christ, the church that belongs to him. So that whatever we ask in his name, we shall receive it. Isn't that what he continues to say in verse 13 and 14 of that chapter that we are reading in John? In fact, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do it so that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask me for something in my name, I will do it. So he went and sat at the right hand of the power to grant us access to whatever we would need to fulfill his mission here on earth. Now, another passage that tells us about that, clarifying that all the more, is Ephesians chapter 1. Paul prays for the church and the believers in Ephesus. And he says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you from verse 16. In my prayers, I keep asking the God of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, the glorious father to give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you will have full knowledge of him. This is my prayer for me, for us, brothers and sisters. He continues in verse 18. I pray that he will give light to the eyes of your hearts so that you will understand the hope to which he has called you. What 
rich glories there are in the inheritance he has promised his people and how surpassingly great is his power working in us who trust in him. It works with the same mighty strength he used when he worked in the Messiah to raise him from the dead and sit him at his right hand in heaven. Far above every ruler, authority, power, dominion, or any other name that can be named, either in this age or in the age to come. Now note verse 22. Also, he has put all things under his feet and made him head over everything for the messianic community, which is his body, the full expression of him who fills all creation. An amazing picture that is given to us to us that the father raised Yeshua from the dead and he raised him up and seated him at the right hand on that seat under which he put all things. He put everything under his feet and indeed made him head over everything for the sake of the messianic community. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you can press in and reflect on what Paul is saying and what Yeshua already said. That if we are focused on his mandate, he has been made head over everything for our sake. So that whatever we ask for in the name of Yeshua, for the sake of the messianic community, everything will be provided. So the question begs, so what is this messianic mandate? What is the mandate that he began to do that you and I ought to continue in? I will invite us to consider Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Yeshua picked up the scroll. This was in Nazareth. He picked up the scroll of Isaiah and he opened the exact space that was written concerning him. And this is what he read. And he said, the spirit of Adonai is upon me. Therefore, he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor, to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of the favor of Adonai. And after closing the scroll and returning it to the attendant, he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them saying, today as you had it read, this passage of the scripture was fulfilled. So Isaiah prophesied almost 700 years before Yeshua came into the scene. And then now Yeshua comes in and he began to say that the spirit of Adonai is upon him to do what? To proclaim, to announce good news to the poor. Now of all the things that you would have said these were the first words that Yeshua proclaimed. So the question begs for us, what is the good news to the poor? What is the good news that Yeshua brought for the poor persons? And I want to address myself to five points that I find when I evaluate the life and mission of Yeshua in the life that he lived here on earth and particularly the ministry that he had. Number one, the good news to the poor is that the king of the universe identifies with you. This is the message that needs to reach all those that are in the streets right now because they lack a place to call a home or a house. This is the message that should reach to every village and every slum area community. 
This is the message that should reach everyone who is lowly, broken hearted and in despair. Those that are feeling defeated and disenfranchised. Those that are feeling like they have lost everything. They have lost their dignity. They've lost their hope. This is the message to everyone who may consider themselves poor, disadvantaged. This is the message. There is hope. Why is there hope? Because on the throne that rules the universe, there is one on the throne. He is the 100% God, 100% man who can identify with your circumstances. The Bible reminds us in Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 15 that we do not have a high priest unable to empathize with our weaknesses. What does it mean to empathize? It means to sympathize. It means to express and have compassion on another. It means to understand in a very deep and personal way, the emotions of someone, the predicament of someone, the challenges and the helplessness that poor people feel. So the writer of Hebrews, and I believe it is Apostle Paul, he says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us. No. Since in every respect, Yeshua was tempted just as we are. Poverty tempts people. Poverty pushes you to the corner. And I know it because I... But in this space, I came to understand that there is someone who identifies with us. So we have someone who can identify with our weaknesses since in every respect he was tempted just as we are. The only difference being that he did not sin. So whereas when we are tempted by poverty and the poor conditions, some of us compromise. Some of us fall short of the standards of God's righteousness. And some people compromise. Some people get into shady deals. And they compromise on their integrity because of poverty. Yeshua did not sin. Although he was hard pressed like all of us are. And verse 16 says, Therefore let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So those who are listening to this message, you may be amongst the poor, but God is saying approach the throne of grace with confidence. And if you are an ambassador, you are a missionary amongst the poor, Tell them this message, proclaim this message to them that we have one on the throne of the universe who can empathize with us, who can empathize with the poor people. And we go there confidently that we may obtain mercy to help in the time of need. The second aspect of the good news is that there is liberty from the shackles. So you do not have to remain in the shackles of fear and defeat. Yeshua came to speak liberty so that the poor can break free from the shackles of poverty. The third announcement is that there is sight for you to see the opportunities available for you. Are you in a place where you are feeling like you're covered by darkness? You do not know which door to knock. And there doesn't even seem to be a door that you can knock. Sometimes that is where poor people feel they have been pressed to. When you see people going and taking changa and other low beverages that destroy their kidneys, their liver. It is because they have 
reached the end. They literally cannot see a hope. They literally cannot see an access, an opportunity to get out. But this is the message for the poor people. That God will provide you with the sight you need to see the opportunities that are available for you. In Genesis chapter 21, we find a narrative of the woman called Hagar. Now Hagar had treated Sarah with a lot of injustice and disdain. She had looked upon her mistress with disrespect. And as a result of that, she had been removed from the community of faith. But God is such an amazing God. Because as she ran away with her child, Ishmael, they reached a bush. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 21, it reveals to us the heart of the father. And from verse 14, we read, Abraham got up early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child. And then he sent her away. After leaving, she wandered in the desert around Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the child under a bush and went and sat looking the other way about a bow short distance from the child. Because she said, I can't bear to watch my child die. So she sat there looking the other way, crying out and weeping. God heard the boy's voice and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong with you, Hagar? Don't be afraid. Because God has heard the voice of the boy in his present situation. Get up. Lift the boy up and hold him tightly in your hand because I am going to make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went, filled the skin with water and gave the boy water to drink. Now, Hagar wasn't a good person by many standards. She had not done what was right. But God is such a generous God and a caring God that he considered her cry. He considered the desperation of the child and he comes to her and gives her sight to see a well of water. Now this is what poor people need. They need to see the opportunity available for them. Because in the shackles of poverty, poor people who are even skilled and able and even trained and even equipped and even educated are unable to see the opportunities. But as children of God, we can help proclaim the good news. That God is the one who opens the eyes of the blind and enables even the poor people to see the opportunities like he did to Hagar. There is a well of water not very far from where you are, but right now you may not be seeing it. But the Lord is saying that if you cry out to God, he will open your eyes and you will see the opportunity that is available for you. That is an announcement that needs to be proclaimed to the poor people. Number four, the announcement to the poor people is that Yeshua came to heal their crushed spirit. Poverty has a way of destroying and crushing your ambition, your spirit. You end up hot and broken hearted but this is the message from the lord that yeshua came to heal the broken hearted those that are crushed in spirit reread luke chapter 4 verse 18 yeshua came to heal those that are crushed in spirit we must proclaim this message to the poor 
because that is what Yeshua came to do. And as his imitators, as his disciples, as people who are called after his name, we must continue with the proclamation to the poor. And number five, Yeshua came to decree and declare that the year of Jubilee had begun. And the year of Jubilee began with Yeshua. It began with his ministry. It began when he decreed and declared it is finished on the cross. No longer should the poor remain in the shackles of poverty. Poverty as a systemic evil has already been crushed and destroyed by Yeshua. It is for the children of God to lead the conversation, seeking the wisdom of God on how poor people can break free from the shackles of poverty. So what should we do, we who are hearing this? Well, number one is to proclaim the message to the poor. We must go and by virtue of our declaration, let our lips give hope. Let our conversations give hope. Let our proclamation speak hope. Because as we speak, the powers of darkness can hear a witness. And the power that comes from the words that we speak will create new realities for those that have been bound by the shackles of poverty. But number two, we must band together and provide relief for those who are in dire need of livelihood. Brothers and sisters, your one unga may feel like it is small, but your unga and my vegetables can feed a family. So let us band together. And I invite you, those who are hearing my message, as we focus on this, our second year of ministry, we want to focus on demonstrating compassion to those who are the lowliest, the least of this. And we want to ensure that to the best of our ability, as enabled by the most holy God, no family should sleep hungry. No child should go to bed on an empty stomach. No child should remain in the streets. And we want to begin this conversation together. But I want to invite you to join my hand. I join my hand with yours and we do this together. We must band together to provide relief. Relief is important, but relief is not the only thing that needs to be provided. Because unfortunately, there are also people that have become dependent on relief. Relief is supposed to alleviate the probability of sleeping hungry. But relief is not the ultimate solution. It is not a permanent solution, but it is a beginning of a conversation. And we must begin there because if we do not provide relief, there are people who are going to be destroyed. There are people who will die. There are children who will be malnourished and sometimes turning back. The realities of malnourishment are so heavy, some people never recover. So we must engage together to do point number two, to provide relief. But point number three, let us coalesce together in providing the bridges, practical ideas and support so that the poor can transit from relief to development. We need to enter into a conversation that gets people out of their space of lack, of inadequacy, of poverty. Get them from where they are in need of relief and transition them to opportunities of development so that everyone can find value in the dignity of work. When a man is able to provide for his family, he is no longer emasculated. He is a dignified man. 
when a woman is able to put food on the table without having to compromise on her morals, then she is empowered. Then she is lifted up and her dignity restored. That is what we need to do, brothers and sisters. And I invite you to consider partnering with People of the Way International. We are providing a platform. Please get in touch with us. You have clothes to share. You have food that you can give and donate to people that are in need. We have put together a budget and we have seen that if we are enabled to provide the foodstuffs for a family, if we are able to raise $40 or 4,000 Kenya shillings a month for a family, we can help that family transit from relief to development. And we want to engage in these conversations. And I don't know what you have to give, but there is something that God has entrusted you with. Please consider to donate. Consider to become a partner with People of the Way International. Let us participate together in the Compassion Project. And you can send your donation to the number that we use for this ministry. The number is plus 254-790-753-494. And if you give to that number, that is the number we're using right now as we, uh, as we pursue a pay bill number. And we have been pursuing this for a while now, but there has been delays in getting it. But as soon as we get it, we will provide it for you. But meanwhile, we have accountability in our office that every amount that is given for donation is enabled to reach to the people who need it the most. And so I invite you to consider to participate in this work. Let us put our heads together. Let us coalesce around this conversation and let's continue on the mission of Yeshua to proclaim good news to the poor. So we are going to reach the end today. And God willing, we will continue with this conversation in subsequent Bible studies. But I invite you to begin to do what the Lord is enabling us to do. Number one, proclaim. Number two, let's band together and donate whatever we have. And number three, let's coalesce together around this compassion project and ensure that we can transit people from poverty, from the place of relief, all the way to the dignified place of development. Not by power or by might, but by the Spirit of God who enables us to excel in all these works. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this evening. And I thank you for the message I have shared with your people Lord Jesus, your heart is concerned about the least of these. You're concerned about the poor. You're concerned about the children. You're concerned about humanity because we are created in the image of God. The Imago Dei in each one of us demands that there be dignity for all people. But right now, oh Lord, even as I share your word, there are people right now who do not have a meal or table and they will go to sleep hungry tonight, oh God. And Lord, I ask you to have mercy. Have mercy on them, oh Lord. Have mercy on us who have more than we need. But probably we've not explored the opportunities available to be able to donate our foodstuffs, our clothes, our skills, our abilities, our networks to get people out of poverty. But as we engage in this conversation, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will look down on us with your favor. Because as POTW, we have endeavored to work with 25 families of poor people, oh God. Lord, I ask that as we engage all the more, that you will illuminate our path, oh God. You will grant us more resources of people, more resources of ideas, more resources of finances, more resources of foodstuffs, more resources of clothing, oh Lord, so that your people will find providence in your 
in your kingdom, O oh God. And so I pray for each one of us that I these things of Yeshua's mission will disturb us, O oh God, and will compel us to move to decisive action. I praise you, Lord, and I thank you because I consider it done already. For this we pray with trust and belief in Yeshua's most precious name. Amen and amen. And when you send that support, please make sure that you accompany it with a message and indicate it is for compassion. It is for compassion to the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God bless you, brothers and sisters.